Hello everyone, I'm Crystal Sunil Irby, mother of three boys and one girl. And I'm Thea Monye, mother of three girls. And I'm Nikisha Killings, also mother of three girls. And welcome to another episode of Dim Black Mamas. Dim Black Mamas. Dim Black we got Mamas. One more to work that out. I'm over it. Maybe we need to like pre record ourselves saying it and just press a button and then it says it like a sound. So effect. you think I need to edit it in? And it not be live. Is live working? I mean, no. Li- <laughs> we ain't, we ain't hit that. We ain't hit that note. We ain't hit that note in ten episodes. But I feel like we need to have like choir rehearsal offline. It's like be together. Like okay, now one, two, three. Go, like practice. Yeah, real. but I think even if we do that, I don't think we're gonna be able to come in at once. But maybe I can line it up better if we just record it off and I, you know, drop it mm. in. You know. I am not hopeful. What if we have um, the guy who does the Allstate commercials do a voiceover and come in and be like, dim black mamas. Woo, I kind of feel that. It don't have to be him. We could use, I don't know, common. How are we going to get in touch with these people? (laughs) Girl, listen. We can figure it out. Let's have a kid come in and see it. Oh, we got kids all around us. That's oh, super cute. I like, I like that, that idea. I like that. I want Zion to say it. Oh, you know, mm-mm. no, you don't. Or Karis, Karis can say it. We need the youngest to say it. Not, not, no, you know, Karis is my like house. just. I mean, he can say complete sentences and everything, but he also has a southern accent along with. Does he really? Uh, yes, he says. Oh, I so want to do it by myself, and I was like, that's that's. <laughs> Two syllables and it should be like, <laughs> wow. Yeah. As though, though, the folks that are all around I him know. in that house don't have that twang every now and then. When you are talking to Rashad, you yeah, sound I'm like a completely family, different person. Really different. My favorite Karis line is, uh, oh, me too. That is- <laughs> so, so Karis does this thing frequently and i say freak almost every time i'm on the phone with crystal one of two things is happening she's ordering food she's ordering food through a drive through or <laughs> she is warning the boys that if they don't calm down while she's on the phone they're going to have to go to their room which and always ends their room. always ends yeah. in them having to go to their room <laughs> and so it always goes like this you know rj Karras, i'm on the phone okay literally 2 minutes later rj Karras, this is this is it I'm on the phone. I already told you. Okay. They say, okay. Third time, it's like, go to your room. <laughs> go to your room. RJ tries to negotiate. It, it just, it, it does not go anywhere. That negotiation goes nowhere. But this is how I picture it in my head. Yes. RJ leaves the room first, and then Karis <laughs> goes, everyone, like, me too. And then, and then Chris is like, yes, you too. And then, this is my favorite part, Karis goes, <laughs> Yeah. It's just, and it's like the cry goes nowhere. It just does this <laughs> this one arc note, uh, and then it goes to his room. It, I wait for it every single time. I it told never him, fails. I'm offended by your fake cry. As a performer, <laughs> your fake cry is the absolute worst. I, when he starts oh. it, I'm always like, you gotta oh. work on that fake cry. Like, it's so terrible. Oh it's completely unbelievable. Girl. Oh, the it world is, is literally the moment I know. The world's a stage. And you know what I say? After I hear the fake cry, I go, yeah. and see. And I told him. Because I know that it's, it's over at that baby. point. You know, oh, me and RJ so told sorry. him. RJ said, yeah, your fake cry is just like this one sound. Like, you don't even like you know, go up and down and you don't make any tears. And I was like, RJ, you can make tears. He's like, oh, yeah, I can do tears. And I was like, see, you need to work on the fake cry. Because if you're going to try to fake me out, like really try to put some oh, effort into it's it. It's literally consistent. Everyone? Yes. yes. He thinks he's not. Uh, he thinks things don't apply to him. He really <laughs> thinks things don't apply to him. I told you, Crystal, it's his hair. It's his hair. You're going to have to cut it like Samson. And he does oh, not no. want to cut. Not his he string. Want, yeah, he no. doesn't want to cut. Of course not. It's like feathers. Listen, this. I told you this was going to be a problem yeah. when he was like super young. His hair was like feathers. Like, I'm talking like when Oprah had the feathered front in the, like, it's like feathers. Mm-hmm. It was like a fresh press. And yeah. everybody raved about his hair. And I said, Crystal, you got to stop him because I picture him growing up 
wearing a wife beater and being one of those dudes in the hood that everybody gives a pass to because he got good hair. You know the kind of, their nicknames were was like Baby Indian. Remember those? Those are specific gangsters. We're talking about specific gangsters now. Their, their name always has something to do with Indian to imply that they had Indian in their family. And they always wore two French braids oh, to show oh, off their hair. That sounds Remember? like an L.A. Okay, so that's Type of I, right, so I said, Crystal, I have seen this before. <laughs> Wife beater, the French braids, his nickname's gonna be Baby Indian, Baby Indian, which is not even like socially correct. And if you don't put a stop to people in this hair issue, and I think it's too late. I think it's in there because now he's he just really feels like there's special circumstances for him. But you know, you may be right about the hair. My nickname for him is Care Bear, and Rashad's nickname for him is. Karis Bear's Pushy Wooshy. And so we've narrowed it down and it's become Pushy Wooshy. It was it was Karis Bear's Pushy mm-hmm. Wooshy. And then it was Pushy Wooshy. And now it's just Pushy, which is a really mm-hmm. kind of, mm-hmm. I could see him good <laughs> nigga name. Mm-hmm. It's what it is. I know what you're trying to get to, but I'm going to say it for you. Lord Jesus, all I'm saying is he going to find some chick that know how to French braid and he's just going to be done for. They're going to have like five kids because <laughs> that's how it goes down. They used to go with the woman who could break their hair the best. I'm just imagining down. this grown pushy with the now two French braids. Pushy. With, the, with the French braids. Too much. Pushy. Pushy. Yeah. You know, in West African tradition, they say the name calls out the destiny, bitch. The name calls out but the destiny. But his de- name means love. The destiny. Y'all got to ask yourself, what are we calling out when we call this child pushy? What are we pushing out of pushy? <laughs> what are we the pushing out of pushy? Love. Yeah, but you're not saying Karis. You're saying pushy. What are we you pushing out of pushy? Care Bear or we call him pushy? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Okay, we'll work on that. We'll see. But he does not want his haircut. Why would he? Why would he want his haircut? Do you know the privileges that hair has given him? Pretty hair privileges. Do you know, like, no. Straight hair, hair privileges. Yeah. Ask him, do you want your haircut? And Rashad is taking him to the barbershop when he takes RJ to the barbershop. And he's like, no. So he's not ready yet. So today's show lineup is a little bit different. Um, We won't be doing what's good today because we have some major news, a really, really big announcement that we're excited about. So we're going to talk about that um, in place of what's good. So after that, we'll do our mac and cheese segment. And in our mac and cheese segment, we'll be talking about black love And as always, we'll have some wonderful collection plate causes and we'll end with Black Mama Say. But before we jump into our show, we have a very, very exciting, exciting, exciting announcement. I'm like super, super duper, super, super califragilisticexpialidocious. Yes! Excited (laughs) about this announcement. And this is going to do fantastic things for our podcast. So just a little backstory. Um, On Facebook, I always read the comments on my, on people, my friends' statuses, even if I don't comment. So I would see this woman who would always make comments on one of my friend's statuses, like encouraging her to write, encouraging her to use her writing to make money. I was like, who is this woman? I want to be friends with her. Like she's always encouraging this person to write. And I just wanted to be friends with a black woman who did that on Facebook. So I friended her. And when I clicked on her Facebook page, there was a conference on there called Black Moms Connection. I was like, whoa, what is this? This is pretty dope. There's a conference for black moms. (laughs) So me, I click on the website, then Black Mamas started following Black Moms Connection on Instagram and Twitter. And she hit me back on Twitter and it was like, hey, them black mamas, we totally need to talk. You know, her name is Tanya Hales and she's a founder of Black Moms Connection. So we had a fantastic conversation. And what came out of that conversation is a wonderful partnership. Them black mamas. Yeah, drum oh, roll. Yeah, we ain't got no sound effects. Okay. Woo! <laughs> so um, them black mamas. <laughs> Will, well, is now the official podcast of Black Moms <laughs> Connection. Woo! I am, Woo! I, you know, 
So shout out to our Black Moms Connection listeners who are tuning in. Yes, shout out to you guys. Welcome, welcome. Forgive us in advance. And I forgive us in advance. (laughs) Yeah, you know, sometimes we have some time to feel difficult. Yeah, we just, but we've come a long way. We used to. This is judgment free zone. Tyra Weave, episode one, season one, and now I, I think Mm -hmm. we're into like season two. Or at least like season five. I think we're like Tyra Weave season five, America's Next Top Model. But this is so exciting on many, many levels. Number one, because just the organic way in which it started, just wanting to fill my circle with someone who uplifts and believes in black women. And just following someone on Twitter who's doing an amazing thing, a conference for black mothers. You know, I think a lot of times, sometimes we can see someone doing something and we feel a sense of competition. That's not how I feel. If I see someone doing something that's relevant to them black mamas, I'm like, hey, let me support them or let me find out a way to build with. Yeah, yeah, we're building a coalition. This is the way that it should be. It really is. Yeah. So the thing I love about this is that I I think we we feel strongly that we are representing a voice of black mm -hmm. women, black motherhood that isn't Mm -hmm. out there. And then to connect with the forum where Black mothers come together yeah. um, just makes perfect sense and furthers all of our yeah. mission to to help us all be heard. I love it. And to celebrate oh, the diversity yeah. of yeah. Black yes. motherhood, right? Like to really, like that's like, that's super exciting because they're yeah, based they're, well, in Let me just Toronto. tell you a little bit about them. Um, black Moms Connection, their mission is, uh, well, our mission is um, providing a safe and encouraging environment for Black mothers to connect over shared cultural experiences by encouraging and empowering mothers to increase the social, emotional, financial, and well-being of the Black family. We will positively impact the Black Mm. community and the world at large. It started in January of 2015. BMC started as a simple concept to rebuild the ideas that it takes a village to raise a child. Mm. What started with 20 mothers in the greater Toronto area has grown to almost 9,000 members worldwide with mothers as far as Japan, Kenya, and the Caribbean. Black Moms Connection was incorporated as a nonprofit organization in 20, November 2016. And regarding meetings, administrators and members plan local meetups while supporting small businesses. There are also workshops and events. And Black Moms Connection held its first annual Black Moms Connection conference in 2017. And this year, in place of a conference, Black Moms Connection will be having a summit Saturday, September 15th. And we'll include the link for that in our show notes and where you can go buy tickets and all the information on that summit. Um, So those of you who want to attend and learn more about Black Moms Connection can attend. So this is going to result in some great, great events. So you won't just Mm -hmm. be able to listen to us, but you'll be able to come and um, to interact Interact. and to see us live. And we're just really excited about what can um, come out of this. The founder, her name is Tanya Hales, and she's just a really, really dope and supportive black woman. And the vibe from her is like, she just wants black women to win. She really, really wants black women to win. And another thing that I really like about this is it expands our network. It takes us beyond um, the States because they're based in Toronto. And let me just put this out there for those of our new listeners with Black Mama Connection. um, We will go international for you (laughs) and do a live podcast. We would love nothing more, we'll to you. okay, than to go to the Caribbean, <laughs> King of Japan, all of it, boo, all of it, and film yeah. and, and like record and film directly up in your space. So yeah, and that's just and out this there. This is going to allow us to have some great guests. We've never had a guest on the podcast, so that's going to allow us to have some great guests. Just get some feedback and input from uh, a Black Moms network that can really push them Black Mamas forward. I'm excited about this because, you know, this isn't easy. We just don't get on here and talk. We really uh, are intentional about what we do and Mm -hmm. how we're building. And so to build for a year and then have this partnership, I'm just really excited about this and just extremely 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 grateful because sometimes I know I'm guilty of being caught up in well we really don't have a big platform and you know we only have 500 followers and you know I I can not 
give ourselves credit for what we've built. And so to have someone come in and say, yeah, I think what you're doing is great. And I think this is how we can support and build with each other and not have the big numbers. Because sometimes people think you have to have the big numbers in order to make a big move. And to me, this is proof is like, no, if you just hustle, put in the work, and support you do the work. and if you and, have quality and support work other yeah. people who are doing the type mm-hmm. of work that you can do yes 2018 mm-hmm. is going to be amazing yeah. for yeah. damn black mamas it's also a reminder for all of us because we we stress the fact that we're black mother creatives as well and like how to carve out that time to like create for ourselves that the creation is the most important piece of that because if you have something mm-hmm. that you're creating and you believe in other people will feel that energy mm-hmm. and that investment and they'll find their, you'll find your way to each other. And that's, I think, exactly what we're doing here. So we're really excited about new listeners. Again, you know. We're sorry. No judgment. You know, we're real, real free. free up in here. We like are. it gets we're real raw. free. We're raw. And, but I um, hope that's what you appreciate. But we but we're trying we're to say free. you free yeah. too. You, we want you to be free too. We want you to be free. So we're not recording in a studio yet. Everybody's just like in a room in their house with the door shut. So, you know, it's real. <laughs> and my door ain't even <laughs> shut. Like sometimes you hear. Sometimes you hear Riley or the, the gardeners. We've had stuff. We still need to like record this you know, setup. We need somebody to see this we little do. Skype screen that we, we have. To see how it, it works. Really is yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Most other podcasts are done by people all in the same room and we are all over. Actually, that's not <laughs> true. What I no, no, what I discovered, there was a thread, um, Pods in Color, Podcast in Color. If you are a podcast head and and you love podcasts and you're looking mm-hmm. for podcasts by people of color, go follow a podcast in color on Twitter. Um, the person who created it is really dope. Her name is Barry and she created a whole directory podcastingcolor.com of people of color who do podcasts and she broke it down by subject matter and also followed a hashtag pods in color. But she did a thread of uh, like where people were located so they can try to like meet up. And what I found in following that thread was there are so many people who who uh, have co-hosted in multiple locations. So that yeah, is, that's mm-hmm. really I thought interesting. that was really. I wasn't Great. expecting that. That was really. I thought that was really interesting too. Yeah. So we're really, 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 really excited about that. And so, yeah. So yeah. good things ahead. So um, so we can move on and start the show and jump right on in. Okay, I'm going to intro our mac and cheese segment. Our subject today, and you know, we have bad at this around, but sometimes you just aren't in the right space to have these conversations, and we don't like to bring you our struggles all the time. So we are ready, though. We are all finally in the place at the same time to discuss Black love. Well, I would say when we decided to do this topic, I was really a little bit apprehensive because I was like, in terms of talking to your children about love. I I was like, wow, I talked to my kids about sex and the pitfalls of relationships, but I don't know if I really had a conversation (laughs) about like love. Like, what do you think love Mm -hmm. is? Or how do you feel like you find love? How do you feel like you sustain love? And so I text um, our daughter, our 20 year old, and I asked her what she's learned about love from us because we've never really had a conversation about it. And I'm going to read you what she texts me back. So I said, I need an honest answer based on what you've witnessed of me and your dad's relationship. What do you believe love is? What's your definition of love based on what you've seen from us? Or do you see love in our relationship? What have you learned good and or bad about love from our relationship? She replied. So from watching you two, I've learned that love is growing. Love has a lot to do with growth and changes and that love and loving someone isn't selfish. I've learned that love is not perfect. Like it's not always going to be sunshine every day, but it will be okay. Love is surprising. I think you and my dad are soulmates. I think my definition of love is caring about another person the way you care about yourself and seeing that person in yourself. Wow. Yeah. If I had texted him to Lonnie that, they would not have <laughs> responded. They'd be like, what, what are you writing Why a book? are you asking this? What are you doing? What is that for? And Why I, are you asking that? I replied, I said, I realized growing up, my mom or adults didn't talk to me about love. They educated me about sex, but not love. And I didn't really see it in my family until my siblings started getting married. And she said, yeah, 
Like I never saw love or what I considered love until you and my dad got married. Mm -hmm. So that really, you know, I know that we always say it's important to model positive, intimate partner relationships for your children. But it did make me sad that because uh, her dad and I got married when she was 11. Mm -hmm. And so for the first 11 years of her life, she felt like she never saw intimate partner love. And so I just wondered what kind of impact does that have on a black child uh, and specifically a black child, because you're also experiencing a whole lot of other things as a black child, as a black girl child, you're experiencing racism, you're experiencing sexism. And on top of that, you're not seeing intimate partner love. Mm. You know, those are some vital, vital years, uh, zero to 11. So I just wondered... Like, what does it do to us as a community if we're not talking to our children about intimate partner love, if they're not seeing intimate partner love? Is that if that's not a top thing on our list? I kind of get why it's not, because the institution of marriage in this country has a lot to do with capitalism and white male supremacy and how we perpetuate marriage and partnership in this country is problematic. But what does it do to us as a as a community if a child zero to 11 undoubtedly is experiencing racism, undoubtedly is experiencing sexism, even if she can't name it or call it that, doesn't see in intimate partner love. So to go back and think about it therapeutically, think about the people that come into my office seeking love, wondering why they can't have love, all these different things. One of the key things I have to always remind them was, did your parents receive love? Did they know what love was? Like, what were they birthed into? I, I think... Part of our struggle is we've always had black love. There's this book I I ordered. I was working on a syllabus for a course I was going to teach on the black family. And it was like letters and poems and things. I'll try to find the the title. And it was like to demonstrate that black love existed all the way through the Mm -hmm. enslavement Mm -hmm. of kidnapped Africans. Right. And um, to to dispel the myth that we didn't have love. Mm -hmm. I think that disconnect from love or the idea of black love is more recent. I, historically, it's been there. It's been sustainable and it's been what kept us. And we were very clear about it. But that's because we came from a African-centered space that family and village were what really, really, really mattered. It wasn't until we always talk about integration being such a turning point and, and economics and the idea of like capitalism began to like really penetrate our communities that the the idea of what love is became more uh distorted and in some ways you know i i say perverse not sexually but i say it, be, mm-hmm. it became perverse because it became of another culture's mm-hmm. idea mm-hmm. Of, of love and so i think that for at least i would say that like the last three or so generations before ours may have began to adopt the white version of what they saw love be and think that that was what they had to do. And in doing that, we lost our sense of what black, we lost our definition of black Mm -hmm. love. Um, And and, and that has been problematic because what we thought love was then was, you know, making sure we had enough money to do this, making sure we had enough money. I'm working, I'm doing this. It was all, and it was, it was provision. And that was like, why don't you see that? And and the, the, the emphasis on connection Um, was, was decreased. So I get a lot of, you know, first generation students, brown and black students who come in and they're like, well, you know, my dad provided, my mom took care of us. The the care is a big word, Mm -hmm. you know, but not loved. We didn't talk, you know, they didn't, they they didn't ask how my day was. Um, They didn't come into my games. They were working. And so it got swapped out for this capitalist idea of what, you know, love is. And so I think that that definitely has been damaging because now we're going out into the world seeking that as an over. Mm-hmm. You know, if you ask a woman sometimes or a, 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 a young person, um, male or female, what, they're, what they want in a partner nowadays, um, it's very different than what you would have thought about you know, three or four generations back. I mean, and and some of that was survival. And a lot of that was, you know, again, always having to live and love beneath the black gay, the white Mm -hmm. gays in this country. I I think I find that even though there's issues in other spaces, of course, um, and and some of that is built in from from enslavement and violence perpetrated against us. And that also 
entered a lot of violence into our relationship, both emotional and part of my healing process was understanding that someone who wasn't raised to know how to love can feel threatened in ways that you wouldn't think they would feel threatened. They can even feel threatened by somebody trying to love Mm -hmm. them right? If you've been in a certain space for a certain period of time. So um, I think that's why I think this topic is so great because the three of us, I I think, have very loving relationships with our children Mm -hmm. and with our partners. And and we haven't had a conversation about that yet on this podcast. You know what I'm saying? We wake up next to someone we are deeply in love with every day and, and we take that for granted. I have to remind myself sometimes that turning point we talked about in my previous marriage, made me wake up and think, oh my God, what am I showing my kids? Mm. Like in terms of... um, How did you feel about that? How did you... What that moment demonstrated to me was either this was a person who did something knowing it would hurt you or if they thought, oh, it won't really hurt her that bad, then they don't know you. So that means there's a lack of intimacy. There's a lack of connection. Either way, whether conscious or unconscious, Mm. there's a lack of awareness and intimacy that you could do this thing to a person and not see it that way. I never see it thought that of way. it as a lack of intimacy. Yeah. yeah, because you have to disconnect from a person to harm them. Here's the rea- That's the reality. And and what I, one thing I'm trying to make people more conscious of Tweet is that out. I'm trying to use the word <laughs> I'm trying to use the word abuse more frequently in yeah. small things. I believe we all engage in acts of abuse on a daily basis, every single one of us, whether that's interrupting somebody, whether that's, you know, minimizing somebody's opinion, whether that's, you know, dismissing someone's feelings. These are small, but they have to be acknowledged as acts of abuse Mm -hmm. because they're not acts of compassion, right? And they're acts that even in a small way make another person shrink a little bit. Right. So that's how I tell people, you know, it's abuse if you shrink, even if it's small, even if it's somebody like you gonna wear that and you kind of cower down a little bit. That's an abusive act. Right. Because it made somebody feel small. And our goal should always be to let people feel like they can. Bell, Bell grow. Hooks talks about that in her uh, book, All About Love. She says there is no way that abuse and love can coexist. And we have to- They cannot. They cannot. You're either choosing um, an act of compassion or an act of yeah. abuse. And, and I want us to become more conscious of that in our interactions because until we can say, I perpetuate abuse in this way to my partner, to my children, we can't change that to acts of um, yeah. compassion. And so in that moment, that was an act of abuse. So what I had to think of my kids, I had I was saying like to my kids, okay, that this is the age at where they learn more from what I do than what I say. Mm-hmm. And in fact, that starts from birth. They really do learn more from what we do than what we say. When people stay together for the kids, it's yeah. a false narrative. The kids know the entire time, right? I'm gonna tell you that off the bat right now. They come into my office, they know. And then they wonder, well, then they feel bad and guilt that you stayed because of them. So that's a whole nother issue. But I realized that I wanted my kids to be able to experience intimacy. And I was with a partner who was Mm. unwilling to build intimacy. Even now, like, you know, I I know that at times it has been difficult for them to have uh, a step parent. But what I think in my head is, you know, even if they don't get anything out of the step parenting part, they see somebody who shows up for me consistently, who accepts me as I am, who loves me, who's there for me, and who does the same for them. That's intimacy, mm. you know, yeah. that I can be flawed and loved, that I could be treated this way and not feel afraid that I will be harmed or judged in some capacity. So I'm okay with my decision to leave that marriage because I, one of the big motivating factors was I cannot let my kids grow up thinking this is love and this is intimacy. I, I just want to, there's so, so much good stuff there that Thea said, I and mean, we could unpack this for a long time. I just want to, I guess, say that so much of what you've shared has, was my experience as a child witnessing my parents' relationship. Mm, so mm-hmm. um, I, I guess I'm the only one of the three whose parents are still together today. Um, and mm-hmm. they were not together my whole life in the, you know, 40 plus years because of intimacy and, you know, this deep, deep love and affection mm-hmm. for one another. They were together because that's what you do. I don't think that's isolated. I think... Oh, absolutely not. Parent, I, I think that my mom and 
Thea's mom were probably rare. Oh, yes. Like they're so, oh, yeah. yes. Mm-hmm. And I don't even know if I necessarily judge couples who've made that choice. I, I yeah, have a clear, clearer understanding of why it is. I know I don't want that for myself, yeah. but, this, but I don't know if I necessarily judge it. Go yeah, ahead. no. So I, I guess my yeah. point is in witnessing their relationship as a child, I got in my mind that, you know, you decide who you're going to be with and you stay with that person. Period. There's not a lot. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be mm-hmm. good. Doesn't have to work. Doesn't have to be enjoyable. <laughs> this is just who you signed up to be with, and you mm-hmm. stay with that person. Also, mm-hmm. not seeing intimacy and you know true, genuine affection for one another helped to paint this picture for me that the the um, one person's role is provider, the other person's role is caretaker, and that uh, those are the roles in a marriage. And it took me until adulthood to decide that I was going to reframe those roles for myself in marriage and Mm -hmm. not Mm -hmm. accept that who wants to be married miserable for 40 something who wants to do that right not me not the kid Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. you know I just made the decision Mm -hmm. I you know at some point you have to say I'd be okay with being alone if if I can be all of me Mm -hmm. um that I don't necessarily need another Mm -hmm. person I had to get to that place before someone my husband could come Mm -hmm. along and come alongside me and together we could build something Right. I was, uh, I, that's how I expected my life to be. Like, I was yeah. like, I'm not gonna get married. That's just not in the cards for me. Not trying to live that life. Yeah. Um, and even when my husband proposed, I was like, you want to marry me? You sure? And like <laughs> leading up to the marriage, as Thea, like her mom came over one day mm-hmm. and she kept saying forever. And I was like, oh my God, that's, ugh, that's, Oh, yeah. that would make my shoulders get forever, Crystal. Like, forever, forever, Crystal. Are you sure, Crystal? It's forever, Crystal. <laughs> and I continuously pushed the wedding date back because I had just so much anxiety um, about that. And what I've come to discover is the first years of my marriage, I really didn't know what love was. I really did mm. not, and I don't think that I loved my husband in a good way at all because I really didn't know what it was. And I also thought I had an unconscious idea that black men couldn't be hurt. Mm. So like mm. he said he loved me. Mm. So no matter what I did, no matter mm. what I threw at him, because I'd never seen black the black men in my family black male vulnerability. In, in a relationship. I'd seen black male vulnerability mm-hmm. in terms of an inability to protect their family, but I'd never seen black mm-hmm. male vulnerability in an intimate partner relationship. So I didn't think that mm-hmm. they got hurt in those relationships. And I think that I loved him that way. And I began to read mm. um, a book called All About Love by Bell Hooks. Because by Bell Hooks, yeah. Bell's I would see book. books on love, but I'm a feminist. Mm -hmm. I was wondering how can I be a feminist and sustain love in a heterosexual relationship? And how Mm -hmm. can I teach my kids that? And so I started to read this book, which is like a fantastic. Amazing. You have to read it. You have to read it. And there's a quote in here by Diane Ackerman. Love is the most important thing in our lives, a passion for which we would fight or die. And yet we're reluctant to linger over its names. Mm Without a vocabulary, we can't even talk or think about it directly. And the the thing that I love most about this book is the definition of love that she... Yes, I, I have it on my wall in my therapy yeah, office. Yeah, the definition of love mm-hmm. that she uses in this book. And it's not Bell Hooks' definition. It's a definition by psychiatrist M. Scott Peck. Mm. And it's from his self-help book, The Road Less Traveled. And the definition of love that she Mm -hmm. uses in this book is the will to extend oneself for Mm -hmm. the purpose of nurturing one's own or another spiritual growth. Mm. The will to extend oneself for the purpose of nurturing one's own or another spiritual growth. And that was life changing for me because I began to think about how I love my husband and how I love my children. Do you do you extend and do you make them grow? Do people grow around you? And I felt like. I love my children that way, but I did not Mm -hmm. love my partner Mm -hmm. that way. And she goes on to say that we are taught we have no control over our feelings. To begin by always thinking of love as an action rather than a feeling is one way in which anyone using the word in this manner automatically assumes accountability and responsibility. 
Most of us accept that we choose our actions, that intention and will inform what we do. We also accept that our actions have consequences. To think of action shaping feelings is one way we rid ourselves of conventionally accepting assumptions such as that parents love their children automatically or that one simply falls in love without exercising will or choice that there are no such things as crimes of passion or he killed her because we love, because he loved her. If we constantly Oof. remember that love mm. is as love does, we would not use the word in a manner that devalues and degrades its meaning. When we are loving, we openly and honestly express care, affection, responsibility, respect, commitment, and trust. Definitions are vital starting points. Let me let me jump in here, Crystal, because I think what that speaks to is two things that from doing therapy, from working with people, and then from my own experience, I've learned. Because we asked, we were one of the questions we talked about was, what do we wish someone would have told us mm-hmm. about love? Which I don't think a lot of people know mm-hmm. what to tell us because that book gave me a working right. definition. But love is a very like it's a it's a very abstract word to us right. in the in the world. So we don't know how to be in love. And I say that because like being in love is an actual state of being. I remember in a previous relationship wanting the person to love me so much. I would read, Crystal knows, I would read all these books Mm -hmm. on what I could do to change myself, make myself better. And somewhere during that process, I decided that instead of trying to have this person love me, I wanted to become love. I thought about how many people die and real and feel like they never experience love. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I want if a person comes into contact with me, I can give them authentic connection and they know in that moment that I genuinely love them. And that's probably why that decision, Crystal knows, strangers walk up to me on the street all the time. I think because I put out that intention. I think your poem in Murmurs mm-hmm. of a Mad Woman called Autopsy. Mm-hmm. I think it speaks to how you want to live that out when you talk about someone doing mm-hmm. an examination we'll have to share of their that. body we'll have to share that. and and what you want them yeah. to see when they open you up. To I see. Think that's a, I think that poem. Exactly. That and I think that moment was very transformational for me because that meant I, I, everything I did had to be rooted in love. But but that's a, a very it conscious is. decision that came through a lot of mm-hmm. pain. And so we don't know how to be in love for... And I think there's two big reasons why. One is... Um, Love is painful. And we don't talk about love as being painful. But love is painful because growth is painful and love inspires growth. Mm. Say that again. So Not love painful is painful in an abusive no. way. So I was just okay. about to say, love is pain yeah. with a purpose. Mm-hmm. Growing so pain. The pain right? that you feel yeah. in love, yes, is something that at the on the other side of that pain, there's growth. I have clients, I tell them, how do you know if it's love and how do you know if it's abuse? Love makes you grow. Abuse makes you shrink. It's very simple. One makes you bigger. One makes you smaller. Very simple. But because we assume love means the absence of pain, we don't know how to be in the state of love, in the space of love, and and evaluate whether this pain has a purpose. On the other side of this pain, will there be growth for me? Will there be growth for the other person, right? The second thing is love is a skill set. It people isn't something don't want that you are born that. knowing to do. Yeah. It isn't something that yeah. you are born knowing because to do. That's I, not sexy. I feel but like that's not sexy. Yeah. That's it's not, not romantic. It's not only is it not sexy, but it's it nobody wants to do the actual work. So the skill set of love is patience, humility, kindness, compassion, forgiveness. Um, you know, being able to step, be objective and step outside of yourself and your feelings, communication skills. Um, it's, it's a, it's an ongoing process. It's a, it's a life journey and it's a life journey that you have to be committed to. And people don't want to do that. People don't want to do the work to manifest that skill set. They just don't feel like doing it, but they They want the benefits of love. And so part of the benefits of love are that it puts us in uncomfortable positions that lead to growth. And so then you have to ask yourself, do people avoid love because they don't want to, because they want to oh, avoid that's growth, because they want to avoid pain. That's why. That's right. because right. when I really think about, well, Crystal, why wouldn't you want to get married? I mean, I had my political reasons as to why I didn't want to yeah. get married, yeah. but I didn't believe I had the ability to sustain love. The longest relationship I had before Rashad and I got married was six months. Mm-hmm. And 
I just had not seen that exhibited until my siblings got married. And I, then I'm very, very, very different from my siblings. I'm very, very different from them. Not mm-hmm. in a bad way. Like I love them dearly, but I'm different from them. And so I didn't feel like I had the skill set that it took mm-hmm. to sustain mm-hmm. love. I, I really did. It is a skill set, people. I, w- I listen. If you don't, it's a skill set. It's it's something and you have to want I also to develop. Had a lot of healing yourself. to do, and I wasn't ready to. I really wasn't ready to that. do that growth. Mm-hmm. I think that the season that you and I spent, Crystal, being celibate, being alone, kind of really getting to know ourselves, set us up for being better wives. Although the the beginning was rocky period, at least for me. I think you mentioned in the beginning you. Had to, you know, learn on the job. No, celibacy. Not I celibacy. will say. Be, be being single. Being single. Can I say that? No. Or, no. For me then. No. For me. <laughs> for me. <laughs> and I was but in a thing, real life. You be careful it, when you it, Nikisha, honestly, it should have. But you know, I, yeah, yeah, you it know, just, it, for me, it was, uh-huh. yeah. But yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> for me, yeah. being alone that long, and it was four or five years, I think, um, allowed me to re- really from the backup dancer. Mm, you know That's what? So... You know what? You're not allowed to say that. Wait a minute. That. There's a backup. No, girl. Dancer? He looked like a backup dancer, though. Like if you, yeah. Okay. Like if you see okay. his old pics, like an R and B nigga. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Sorry, Keith. Was that during a genuine era where everybody had to? Uh, <laughs> yeah, they, mm-hmm. yeah. See, that really messed us up. That messed up a whole generation of women. But we'll talk I about that. Yeah, that messed up a whole generation of women. Yeah, a whole generation. <laughs> Right, it's messed up a whole Nikisha, generation. You got free today. Now you know why you was in that relationship. It was a, it was a genuine or it, it was, was genuine. You, Listen, it was he don't get his. You. He's probably on you know unsung what? somewhere, was, but he really did. Was he, messed up he wasn't spike on the timeline in terms of we got healed somebody That's today. True. We That's healed true. somebody That's today. True. But did. being alone helped me to see the things that I needed to work on about me, and also helped me to really craft the vision of what does a partner look like to me? What does this person bring mm. to the table? For me, um, one of the things, oh gosh, Chris, uh, Thea, you said so many things. I'm trying to remember. One of the things we talked, when you talked about was being able to help a person or love is seeing the person grow and abuse is seeing them shrink. Mm-hmm. I think this is something you can see immediately in your children, in your relationship with your children. You can, you know, mm-hmm. be harsh and see them kind of shrink down and become less and they're light a little bit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah. you can, you can give mm-hmm. them praise and adoration and they just beam mm-hmm. and they, you know, in an instant, you don't yeah. see that as yeah. much in your partner because they've learned how to oh put up God, walls. But it's happening. They learned how to Ooh. adapt. Yeah. But it's, but it's happening. happening. But it's happening. Right. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so we, we mm-hmm. if we think about mm-hmm. it in these like terms, Christmas terms <laughs> dealing with mm-hmm. adult Girl, I partners, just got set mm-hmm. free. I just got set it's free. It's happening with free. them too. We just, just got set free. see it as, as blatantly. Yeah. 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 Which is why what well, I'm saying Knowing that you are capable of abuse mm-hmm. on a micro level, on these small, small micro abusive levels is important because you're not always going to know when you, you're not going to get that physical mm-hmm. response that you would get from a child. They're just going to pull they're away a little go bit. Into, Something's going to go into my they're defense. Gonna, yeah, yes. They're going to stop saying yes. certain things to you or stop yes. asking you questions or stop, yeah. you know, they're going to just pull away. Knowing that you're capable of that makes you more mindful before yeah. you speak to them. The other thing is mm, I know. I was enlightened, I guess, that I wasn't really doing a great job showing my children all the different ways to love another person, all the different types of love. Um, when my my seven year old is really, really affectionate, she's such a sweetheart, and she would come to me, you know, all the kids I would still kiss on the mouth, you know, the girls just come and give mommy a kiss. She would mm. give these long <laughs> I kiss my girls. They're you know, they're babies. So but she would linger and give me like a five second kiss on it. And I'd be like, okay, that, mm-mm, mm-mm, hold on. So she's doing, <laughs> she's like doing what she saw much. me and my, my husband do. What oh, she sees the princesses oh, yeah. do on TV. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? That's what she thought it looked like. And I was like, okay, so that's a romantic kiss, sweetie. And there's a different type. Mm-hmm. There's a different type of kiss for a mommy. Mm-hmm. For, <laughs> you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. And she was like, mm-hmm. oh, girl, mm-hmm. I just realized. Karen's, oh, Does God. he do the romantic kiss to you? Yeah. <laughs> She's like, I can't, God, Karen I just, I missed that one. His, he puts your face in his hands. Like, he puts his hands on both Aww. sides of your cheeks. And he pulls your face close. And he, you know, I I kind of turn. <laughs> and then he'll try to force me to yes. turn. And I'm like, no, no. Yes. No means no. So, I don't want to kiss mm-hmm. like that. 
But that's how he kisses. Yeah. And that's how, mm-hmm. yeah, that's how I kiss Rashad. Yeah, right? So mm-hmm. that's they yeah. sitting there like, okay, this is love. Let mm-hmm. me give you love, mommy. You know, are you like, oh, oh okay. okay. Uh-huh. Let me talk to you about different types of love. I thought it was because he's going to be a pimp when mm. he grows up. But it's okay. Mm. Yeah, okay. Well, you know, Mm -hmm. that is a pimp move. But however, Nikisha, what you're talking about is important because I think that the other issue we have is that we think love comes a certain Mm -hmm. way and it looks a certain way. So I always try to be aware of the multiple streams of love I have in my life, right? Like, Like Mark's love is tremendous, but if I put everything on his love, like that would put way too much strain on that relationship. I have great streams of love coming from my friends. And this is especially true if you're single. And let me tell you why, because I I get so many amazing accomplished women coming in for session around the issue of being single. And because they're looking at love narrowly, they, they're not recognizing that they have love. You don't have a partner, but you do have love. You have places where you can be accepted for who you are. There is intimacy and a a tremendous amount of intimacy and friendship. My friendships are probably, they historically have been way more intimate than my uh, romantic relationships. Um, And so that you have love. You're not viewing it as love because you, you want this love a certain type of way from a certain partner, but that is very limiting. And even if you get that partner, that's not going to be enough. You're still going to need these other Absolutely. forms of love. Absolutely. I watched this documentary on own called Black Love. Mm. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. it, it was produced by a husband and wife team. And one of the questions that the wife asked in some of the outtakes was, um, what is the biggest threat to black mm-hmm. love? And mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. I think one of the biggest threats to black love is patriarchy. And I say that based Mm. on what you just said. Women are taught to establish multiple streams of loving relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have friends who I can turn to for certain things, who provide me with certain things. Men don't have as many friendship love streams as women do. And so I honestly think because of the expectation that patriarchy puts on Uh, women and wives to be givers, ultimate givers and ultimate nurturers, they look to their partners to give them everything. Mm. Everything. And women Mm -hmm. feel as though they are supposed to provide their partner. And I think this happens in in same-sex relationships as well because we all have internalized Mm -hmm. patriarchy. So you look to one partner to give you everything and then there's a partner that has multiple relationship streams that doesn't Mm -hmm. depend solely on that that partner and so when one partner feels like they're not getting everything they need from that partner from that Mm -hmm. they begin to if they don't choose to grow in that moment they can begin to exhibit behavior that's detrimental to the relationship it can be financial Absolutely. cheating, it can be physical cheating, it can be abuse, yeah. it can be neglect, it can be um, just acting out in all kinds of ways. But I really think that that is a result of patriarchy. I think emotional and affairs I, happen a lot in those situations. Yeah, yeah. I would agree with that. Well, and yeah, there's a myth out there that like women are needier than men. And let me let you know, mm-hmm. a man in love with you is one of the neediest creatures you are ever going to me they want to be with you they want everything from you they like you be like what i thought we were the ones that was like and the, call me you know I, I would venture to say even men who aren't in love with you because maybe they aren't asking for everything from mm-hmm, you but mm-hmm. they're still needy yeah needy right and it's because they're just not allowed like you said to do that emotional yeah. processing yeah. go couple, ahead Nikisha, you were gonna say something. i think um so um crystal and my husband are in fraternities And I think that helps in some way to kind of have a built in network of brothers of men that they can kind of bounce stuff Mm -hmm. off of. But even still, I've seen that in uh, more recent years in my husband's life, you know, most of his frat brothers, they got families of their own. They started, you know, they're trying to trying to Mm -hmm. get it out there and uh, they don't have as much time to connect. They don't sit on the phone and have the Mm -hmm. conversations that we have. They're not chat groups, chat threads, talking all day. They really are silos and it starts to wear down on them. I see that. For sure. Mm. The the answer I had to the, the biggest threat to black love is the black church. Woo! Oh, the saints about to be 
Did I do? Did I pull a Karis? Did I pull yes. a Karis? Woo! <laughs> the Saints about to be bad with Nikisha. Nikisha, I'm not going to the game. Listen, with you. all our Nikisha. new listeners on Black Mama Connection, just just get with us at the end of the episode. Nikisha. Just get with us at the end of the See where we're going with this, because we don't even know. <laughs> we don't even know where we're going with this, y'all. Can't be mad. But you know what, Nikisha? Use a bad yeah, mamma jamma bad right man. now. Use a bad mamma jamma <laughs> right now. We're going to write that book together, boo. We're going to write that book. But you go ahead, because I am... I am. This, the, I don't know, that made me... I don't know, that just did something Thank to me. You. But go ahead. Well, I just want to say, just real quick, just real quick. I just want to say, you guys know I like to get things on the record, okay? So, for the record... Quick, so be real careful what you're about to put on the record right did, now, boo. I just want to say, careful. just for the record. And don't pull a Flynn, Crystal. I may... Don't may, pull a flint. I may edit this what? out. Just, but just for the record, I just want to get this <laughs> recorded right quick. It will not be edited <laughs> just out. Say. It will not be. Just, no. be it, our new listeners are going to ride with us but at the end of this quick, podcast real, and then make a decision. Just, Nikisha, I have all faith in you. But, and I think okay. you just read a couple of But just real quick. What is real her quick, disclaimer? I just want to say, yeah, a disclaimer. I'm already maybe not getting into heaven. <laughs> I can't take any chances. Okay. <laughs> So just for the record, if what she says doesn't pan out, who's at the gate? Peter? Is Peter at the gate? Or Gabriel? Who's at the gate? I think it's Whoever Peter. Is at the, I think okay, it's Peter. Who's ever at the gate? I just want to say, I, I'm not going to walk in with her. I just want to be judged, <laughs> like, on my own. Separately, just you want to be of your, your own? <laughs> Hear me out, not though. Pan out. Hear me out. Okay. okay go. Now, I just want to get that on the record. First go. of all, look at Thea's I'm face. I'm so excited. First of all, who's in the black church? Who's in the pews? Who's in the pew? Women. Who's getting women? women? Black women. women. We get women, women. right? Mm-hmm. So we're filling mm-hmm. up churches and we're sitting under the patriarchy, patriarchy getting the word. Mm-hmm. And the word mm-hmm. is telling us that our role, first of all, is to be found by a man, to be chosen. Mm-hmm. And then once we are chosen to get in this relationship and be completely selfless, to cater to his needs, to make to take care of him and to mm-hmm. be this wife that um, mm-hmm. honors everything about this man, right? And builds him mm-hmm. up. Mm-hmm. Ain't nobody mm-hmm. building us up. So we get Hashtag love and basketball. Hashtag Listen, love and basketball. Thank you. Problematic movie. So Told you. we get... <laughs> Thea and I know. Thea and I have been through this... Uh, we have good days. <laughs> mega church trauma, okay? Mm-hmm. We got mm-hmm. a little PTSD from mega church mm-hmm. uh, living. Um, mm-hmm. And... What I got from sitting in a mega church for some years as a single woman was that when when my husband came and chose me and found me and all that, I was supposed to be submissive to him. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. So submissive Mm -hmm. to him meant making sure that, you know, he's the head of the household, high priest of the castle, all of that. And that I would um, that I would put aside my own needs and wants and desires for the betterment of our home, for the betterment of our And pray on it. And, and pray, pray on, on it. it, honey. Just give it to God and pray on it. Well, that led me into having a really warped view mm. of my role as wife when mm-hmm. I entered into marriage. And mm-hmm. I spent some years taking care of him, making Ooh. sure that he was happy, his needs were met. And if you I just take care of testimony. him, the Lord's going to yes. take care of yes. me. Yes, yes. Years of shrinking and forgetting mm. who you are. Well, right? you know, in my mega church experience, they tried to. Mm, they Pre- they told let me it, it they prophesied over me that I was I was destined to be a part of this young man's life who was clearly gay. You know what? But my job as a nineteen-year-old woman was beard. to help him when mm. I didn't even think he needed help. Mm. Like we're supposed to be Jesus. We're supposed to sacrifice ourselves yes. for yes. love, for your experiences in the black church to have warped love mm-hmm. in that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can I can see how that's a total threat to black love and how why it's so important that we understand that the Bible, so it's a political context, mm-hmm. it's a historical context, and it's also a spiritual mm-hmm. context. Mm-hmm. And you got to know what you're reading. I've read the Bible, that a Bible that had a strict interpretation, a Bible with the Apocrypha. And I also understand mm-hmm. that what's in the Bible, a group of people decided on these were the books that belong mm-hmm. in there. And I also know what the debates mm-hmm. was. So I know the historical context of that thing. And so it's so dangerous. Mm-hmm. 
who you're sitting under when it comes to your spiritual growth and what yes. they know mm-hmm. and where they're coming from. Like, does this person know the his- historical context of whatever book mm-hmm. they're teaching me mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. out of? Mm-hmm. Is that, Do they understand yeah. that perspective? Because if they only have one interpretation, and let me tell you, it's called the King James Version of the Bible because King James commissioned somebody to translate it in a way that benefited his kingdom. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. why it's called yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, and I, I will say this: oh, my husband um, did not ask this of me. He did not require this. Of right, me. it was right. something. This I is what own. you had learned. It, this is what I learned. So, how did you dis- is, was, How did you discover that, and how did you transform from counseling? That? Mm-hmm. Counseling. Counseling. We looked up one day, and neither of us knew who I was. Anymore. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Say that again. Mm-hmm. You looked up one day, and what? And neither of us knew who I was neither. anymore. He was like, where is this confident swagger having chick I fell in love with? And I was like, uh, I don't know. You know what she's she, I remember you know what I mean? this time. I'm going to tell you, I remember this time. Because around this time, this was just before you started the counseling. I think mm. you, you posted a picture or something. Yes. And I called yes, Crystal. She did call me. And I said, she called me. man she called me. down. She called me. I can't. I can't remember what picture. I, I know. But in the yes. picture, he's like the swagger, the swagger oh, jacket. Oh, an old Lakeisha, picture. Of me. Yeah. You you looked older than you were, and yeah. your you had your face was like just for the like this is for the picture. Like we're well, we, I couldn't see you. Yeah. The same. Um, the, 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 and you're a fiery what person. What gave it away was the shoes you had on flats. Was it the shoes, Crystal? And I, I can't remember. Like we had a, like, I, I feel said, like they man, had a buckle that went across. And I was oh, like, uh-uh. oh, <laughs> I said, Crystal, for the please. record, I don't recall or endorse whatever the <laughs> images of me that they saw. We I won't use know. the images, but I just remember this moment. Yeah. And after that, I like shortly after that, I remember you started the counseling yeah. because um, I, I was like, man down. Yeah, I was in my because, you know, anymore. I knew you out when you were out here in L.A. Yeah. And I think that that's a yeah. big fear for a lot of women is. Are people afraid that they're going to lose themselves in love? Yeah. And it happens so easily. I mean, that happened to me too. You get married, you yeah, have absolutely. kids, absolutely. and you go in with all these ideas of who you are and I'm not going to change. But mm-hmm. those experiences do transform you. And yeah. because no one has taught us how to let those experiences transform us and push us toward a higher self, we end up shrinking into everything everyone else wants us to be. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's and true. I think because that happened to me the first go round, in the second go round, mm-hmm. I was like violently protective of it. Yeah. yeah. I was like, you ain't going to get none <laughs> of Like I had like a Jesus be a fence, Jesus be a fortress. <laughs> I, I was like, <laughs> I really, I feel like a year ago is when I looked at Mark and I was like, oh, you're my husband. Like, I can't keep you out of this space. Yeah. <laughs> because I was so scared of losing myself the way I had before <laughs> that I was, like, violently, like, violently, abusively protective of it. Like, you can't say nothing to me. You can't tell me nothing about nothing. It's all, like, all me, me, me. Like, it was just really, you know, I have been traumatized. Literally, it's been the last year that I've seen myself yeah. understanding, again, because we don't know we don't really know what these words mean. Like, what does husband mean? What does wife mean? What does partner mean? Like, we don't really know, but we go into it with the intention to learn. So it's kind of like you do it and then you learn. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. You set the intention it's and then the you learn. Learning, so everything after that is to help you. Okay. You say you want to be a wife. You say you want to be a husband. You say you want to be a partner. Okay, great. Now that you set that intention, life is going to send you everything you need to make you become that. But you're not that because you set the intention. You set the intention to become that, but you, you're not automatically I'm that. I'm curious, Nikisha, how have you transformed from that awakening or how uh, how are you different now when it comes to exhibiting your love? Oh, that's a good question. So I'm different generally um, in that I am much more in tune with who I am, what I want to be. I'm setting intentions for my you know career, for myself as a mother, for myself as a wife, and I, I am moving throughout the world with intention as much as I can. Mm. I mean, that's mm-hmm. a daily, daily um, challenge for me. And I'm also trying to make sure that I keep pieces of me that are just mine, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. 
that's a new endeavor, a difficult endeavor to, to do in a space where you, you know, are home to kids all day and you have three of them and, you mm-hmm. know, um, and, you know, move frequently and all that. But it's, it's ever so important to make sure that I'm holding on to things that are just mine. For my husband, I am more, or my relationship with my husband, I am most certainly more vocal. I'm back to, <laughs> you mm-hmm, know, mm-hmm. yeah, no, let, you know, letting them know how a sister yeah. feels. Mm-hmm. Instead of saying whatever he wants, whatever you know, okay, well you make the decision and I'll go with, you know, we'll we'll make it happen. Um, I'm now saying nope, I don't agree with it. Nope, I'm not gonna do it. Nope, and I'm going to love you this way because you also need boundaries. Mm-hmm. 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 That's mm-hmm. loving. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. loving. We all mm-hmm. need some boundaries, and when I don't set them, the whole ship goes down. So this is an important role I have in this family, um, and we've established that and we talked through that. I would say that. In my opinion, you know, I'm just gonna go for the gusto because you know, Keisha, you, you really hit me with yeah, that one, and I was like, I feel kind of. Like, and for the record, you know, I'm just gonna go out there and go, say whiteness. Let me go on the record again before we get to whiteness being a threat to black life. Let me go on the record again and say I'm with Nikisha on what she okay. said, mm-hmm. and I will be happy to stand beside her. <laughs> I do you know not what? like this. I do not Some like this turn cold. This is like this? Crystal. This is walking. The edge of snitchness. You know I don't know what it is. You know yet. You're automatically in. Something, so something, I don't want to hear it from you. You are Jesus' favorite. I can't hear it. I'm on the line. You hear me? You got a point. I'm yeah. on the this line. I got to do whatever I can. I can't survive <laughs> in hell. I, my face? Like, She's I like, can't. I, she said, I can't do it. You know, I'm just going to say whiteness. Because mm-hmm. I feel all the things we named so far wouldn't be what they are without whiteness. <laughs> This is true. This is true. <laughs> they just wouldn't be. All that is like back to that is like is. the key ingredient all to all these to things we're talking about. Oh. And had they not spread that shit <laughs> all over the world, we would be able to um, see what the pure version of our shit is. But you know, so they you think there was no patriarchy have- in Africa? I'm not saying okay. that. I'm saying there may have been a different time <laughs> because there was also hella matriarchy in, pa- in Africa. That's true. Yeah. There was hella matriarchy. I think that I think how we defined it, how we used it, how That's we true. Okay. moved within it was yeah. different. I think the whiteness part yeah. of it, mm-hmm. we all adopted their model for capitalism, for religion, for all these different things. And I just, we ain't nobody. Nobody has been right yeah, since. Right. Right. So I feel like the biggest threat continues to be the white gays. And white influence, and I. This is this is what I'm saying. I'm, I'm let me just give this disclaimer because I, you know, I be hard on white stuff. Listen, if I went through 900 years of war, mm-hmm. you know, I might be fucked up too. <laughs> you know, I would have, I would like have like this it, that warps the mind. You know, you are born and die at war. You know, <laughs> humanity is diminished. Right, it becomes about conquering, which means you have objectified living things to survive in that wow. climate. Wow. I'm willing to admit that. The problem is they're not willing to own that ancestry and how that has impacted their relationship with the entire world. Mm. So, cause not everybody was in perpetual war for 900 years. Not everybody yeah. was doing that. We had wars, but 900 years, <laughs> that's a long time, mm-hmm. right? So, and you was drinking out of lead cups in Rome. So shit was going down. Okay. <laughs> We so so I mean, we got the facts. So I just feel like own your ancestors. <laughs> you watch them on Game of Thrones every every week, and you, you sit there like, oh, there you know that's entertaining. No, that's your people. That's your people. Oh, and God. so I feel like because they go own it, they just sprinkled it all around the world. And you know, I mean, so if we can begin to detox. And decolonize. I love it. Decolonize love. Mm-hmm. Decolonize that love. Decolonize Hashtag. that love. Like I said, yes. I, it's not that people didn't have problems, but we had our own problems. Like We did. We, yeah. Can we just deal with our problems? All that you talked about, you know, one of, is a byproduct of, books, of that. One of the books I was reading with, uh, for a project I was working on was John Lessingame's The Slave Community, and he talks about the enslaved mm. Africans who were kidnapped and brought here being forced into the institution of marriage for political reasons, for capitalistic mm-hmm. reasons. Mm-hmm. And it was mm-hmm. such a foreign concept, the way that marriage Say the name of the book here. again. The Slave, the Slave Community, Community by John Blastingame. 
it was just such a foreign concept. Love, fornication, all of these concepts that they were impressing upon the mm-hmm. enslaved were, was just so foreign. And we didn't quite understand. Now, you know, as we do everything, we took it and made it our own right. um, over time. But to just be constricted and forced into these institutions and constructs that we had no concept of, perversion of mm-hmm. love and relationships mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. family mm-hmm. ties happened way back then mm-hmm. and we're still mm-hmm. dealing with the patriarchy. We're still dealing with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. I want to read that. I really want to read that. So uh, I think we did a good job of covering that. I hope some folks was set free. We set Ooh, free. Nikisha stirred up the saints. Jeez. Um, well, you know dear what? Black Moms Connections followers, <laughs> we have the tendency to stir, yes, up, the we stir up the saints a lot. You know, well, here's what all I say. Regular. But Find you see, we all, we all know Jesus. We all do Christmas. But we still Find the lie. will get into it. Find the lie. Yeah. Find the line. Find the okay, so um, we are going to transition into our collection plate causes. And as always, our collection plate causes are causes that we feel you should give your time, attention, and sometimes, yes, some money to. But if you can't uh, give money to it, then we say that you should pass the collection plate by sharing on social media, retweeting, liking, or commenting on social media to help. Uh, amplify these causes. So first up, we have Nikisha. So my collection plate cause is a little heavy, but I want to share it with our listeners um, to get their support. We talked quite a bit over the course of a a number of episodes about Black infant mortality Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. even maternal morbidity as well. There's an organization that tries to honor families at the time of the law, their loss of an infant. Oftentimes it's NICU babies, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, and the program is called the Angel Gown Program. And essentially they accept wedding gowns from women mm. all over the country or the world <clears throat> who send their wedding gowns in and they remake them into little gowns for the angel babies to wear. Oh. As they leave, as they, you know, go to their final resting place. Mm. So they accept donations of wedding gowns from all over. They have over 700 seamstresses in 48 states. Mm. Um, They have a website. Uh, We will make sure to share the link. Um, It's hosted by a group called NICUHelpingHands.org. If you go to their website, you can find the Angel Gown Program. They've been around since 2013. They accept wedding dresses um, during certain periods throughout the year, they are accepting donations for their postage. It's very expensive to mail these little dresses, and they often have to rush them um, to the families who need them to bury their little uh, angel baby. That's a great so, cause. Um, My sister uh, had two stillborn children, um, mm-hmm. so I that is burying them in something is it's yeah. a, it's, a sad, yeah. it's a it's a sad thing, but a necessary thing that could really help uh, someone heal. Yeah. yeah. So if you've got wedding dresses that you um, are ready to part with, anything that you can donate. They also have a, a portion of their um, donation arm that allows you, if you have a business, to put just a little jar out. They have a little sticker you can put on a jar. Oh, okay, that's good. And they collect, you know, collect pennies. And when they, you know, mm-hmm. when the jar fills out, mail that to them. They accept pennies. Uh, they accept anything to help with the postage. That. And, I love yeah. that. And the, yeah. the dresses are completely free. They are no jar cost at all to the families who need them and they rush them, you know, um, overnight if needed to the little babies. All right. So the angel gown program hosted by NICU helping hands. And I'll make sure to um, share the link on our show notes. Thank you, Keisha. You yeah. always do ones we've never heard of, and they're like always so powerful. Once again, Nikisha yeah. has out uh, outdone me um, because it. my collection plate cause is really simple. Okay. This is the time of year. I don't know why that these schools like to make us sell a lot of stuff through these kids, but you know what I would say? Buy a candy bar. (laughs) Because here's the thing. It's so shaming to be the parent. Listen, listen, sometimes we got to go unorthodox with these collection play causes. It's so, first of all, parents hate to see it coming. We all do. We hate them damn candy popcorn sales, especially when they try to get fancy with like gadgets and candles and shit. Ain't nobody got time for all of that. But they send them home. Your kid looks at you and says, you can get this piece of crap if we sell (laughs) 
you know, $500, right? You already know we ain't selling $500, but you have to look like you're making some form of an effort, right? You don't want to go around your job and people see you coming and they like, I ain't got it today. And you got to come back tomorrow and be like, do you have it today? Because the deadline is Monday. It's just a whole damn thing. The Grinch is back. It's a whole thing, right? So all I'm saying is, you know, we don't want to do it. You know we got to save face with these kids who every day is asking for a count. The envelope is empty and it's embarrassing. Plus, the, then you like, the school is judging you like, how how involved are you, right? So, you know, it's a lot of judgment and shame around these damn candy, popcorn, candle sales. If you could just buy the cheapest thing on the damn... <laughs> On the list, please buy it. I mean, we know that the bags are smaller than they appear in the, in the advertisement. They are. They are. We know the cookie dough goes <laughs> sit in the fridge forever. But you know what? Save another parent. Help that parent to save face. You won't get it for a month. We know. We <laughs> already know. You just forgot you placed the order. You forgot you placed the order. Do you show up with the order? People be like, oh, yeah, I did order that popcorn. Yes, you did. And here I am now delivering <laughs> the shit. It's an awful way for schools to raise money, but it's what they do, and parents shouldn't be penalized for it. So if you could please <laughs> pass the plate and buy some of this shit, that would be incredibly oh. compassionate. For the parents. We don't even. Unless you're like Nikisha, who her kids are homeschooled, but if oh. they weren't, they would probably win <laughs> the, the damn $500 year. crap piece prize every damn year. It would be ridiculous. But for those of you who are not, who are more like me, who see that envelope and try to pretend you don't see it, I need you to just buy a couple candy bars and move on. So that's my collection plate cause. It ain't the deepest, I love it. but it's real. Oh I love but it. it's, real. it's real. It's real. So um, those of our those are our collection plate causes. Again, um, if you can give your time to them, your attention to them, to amplify these causes. And if you can't give money, then please pass the collection plate by sharing them on social media. Sharing these causes on social media. All right, now is where we turn transition to our Black Mamas Say portion of the episode where we put our own twist on sayings from Black Mamas. Today, we are going to talk about, first of all, all right, Thea, what you got? First of all, you know what the first of all is? First of all, why are you, why are you telling me? <laughs> Remember that? First of all, why are you telling me? That's it. That's it. Right. Why are you telling me? Like, uh, that is the question. That's my new <laughs> shit. Why are you telling me? Like, why? Well, I don't even know what to say after that because y'all know everything that comes after that <laughs> on every level about everybody and everything. Why are you telling me? Yeah. Did you hear the such and such? Why are you telling me? <laughs> Did you know that? Why are you telling me? That is like me, that is black woman 2018. Crystal, your legit old classic when people try to bring shit to you is you say, first of all, because slavery. Oh, and you shut the oh, whole conversation down. Shut the whole conversation. They don't want to talk no more. <laughs> I do say that. I do say that. You do. I you do, do say that. Because Why slavery. can't we say yeah. the N-word? First of all, slavery. That's can right. you mm-hmm. um, can you tell me why black women and white women, like there's so much friction? Why are you telling me? Uh, first of all, <laughs> enslavement. Can you... Yeah. Um, first of all, why are you telling me? Can you pass the bread? <laughs> first of all, enslavement. 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 No, that is, that is my first of all. I'm often like, first of all, can we talk about enslavement? Okay. Nobody wants to talk about that? Okay. Well, because yep. let me tell you. Then there's no second of all. White people will talk about a whole lot of shit. They will even talk about the civil rights movement. But if you're like... Okay, so the reason is because of enslavement. Then they're like, oh. Girl, how about I was in a lift yesterday, and I knew when I saw a lift driver was white, (laughs) it could go a number of directions. And he saw that I was leaving, you know, the school and everything. And so he's like, I don't know how, I don't know how it happened. I can't remember. But he said, so how do you feel about safe spaces? And I was like, (laughs) why are you asking me? Did you ask your last Lyft driver about safe spaces? I'm paying you a decent rate to not have this conversation. Yeah, I would have said, um, 
first of all, can this lift be a safe space right now? <laughs> Can this, can this, put my can headphones on. A safe motherfucking and lift ride out. Can I get a safe lift ride? Right. Can this lift be a safe space? Can this lift be a safe space? <laughs> Shit. Oh, okay. I was like, "There's a I, you know." I was like, "There's a gift for that. There's a gift for that." Uh-huh. If we was on, if we were texting right now, I would send you something for that. Okay, so that is our show. Remember, we'll be releasing episodes on the 1st and the 15th. Nikisha, follow us on Instagram. I was, I was thrown by that. Did I know yeah. that? It's, it, oh. I don't know. It's the same outline every time. I really, I just want people to know, I don't change the outline. All right, so follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Dem Black Mamas. M-A-M-A-S. Get you some Black Mama magic. Um, and you can write to us. Thea's advice will get you right, and Nikisha will get you pumping. <laughs> I do want to hear their black love stories. Oh, oh yes, yeah. send us some black oh, love so stories. Nice. That would be great. Send us some black love stories. If you know books that are about black love, um, send those recommendations um, to us as well. Also, if you have a top, uh, topic suggestions, you want to know more about us, you can also shoot us an email at themblackmamas at gmail.com. But please, please, please send us your black love stories and we'll definitely um, share those on our next episode or somewhere down the line. That'll be really, really cool. And we'll also oh, put a link. We'll also put a link in our comments in PR in conjunction with the African American History Museum did like a a mini little podcast. I think it's like 20 minutes on black love. And we'll put that in our show links um, as well. So that's all we got. We ain't got no more. Welcome to Dim Black Mama's podcast. Black Moms Connection members. Welcome, Welcome ladies. ladies. Namaste. 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 Namaste.